This is the Master Brewers Podcast, brought to you by the Master Brewers Association of the Americas, a volunteer organization dedicated to continually improving the products and processes of our membership since 1887. Let's go! 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 Master Brewers brings you interviews with the industry's best and brightest in brewing science, technology, and operations. Support for this podcast and the following message come from the Master Brewers Bookstore, where you can find must-have titles like the Practical Handbook for the Specialty Brewer, Beer Packaging, Conference Proceedings, and more. Visit mbaa.com slash store to build your brewing library and make better beer. For fermentation and yeast growth are two different systems. It's a, again, it's a case of no thy yeast. The important thing when you're growing yeast for biomass production, for use in a brewery, is to scale up the process gradually. We found that we have to reduce the number of cycles as the gravity was increased to with the 14, 16, and eventually 18 Plato the number of cycles had to be reduced, and that, was, and that is still, still the case to, to, to this day. This week on the show, I can think of no one better on Earth to discuss yeast propagation with than Graham Stewart. You're guaranteed to learn something, so listen up. Graham, take us back to 1883. How and when did yeast propagation begin in commercial brewing? Well, I think it, 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 the people who started it really were the Carlsberg people. In, in Copenhagen, and as I say, in 1883, a guy called M.L. Christian Hansen uh, was uh, Carlsberg's uh, chief microbiologist at the, what was then the Carlsberg Laboratory, which, as I say, is right downtown Copenhagen, is now the Carlsberg Research Centre. The uh, Carlsberg family, who owned Carlsberg, and still to some extent own it now, um, what it is. Hansen to look at their yeast culture, which they were, they thought it was okay, but they weren't too sure. And so, I mean, what made up that culture? And he found, when he isolated all these yeast strains, that there were four yeast strains. Uh, all were yeasts, but two of them were next to useless. And uh, two of them are not too bad, and one of them, which he isolated and did brewing trials on, is still used by, for, for Carlsberg production to this day. Uh, then he was confronted with the problem, is how do I culture this yeast so I can get enough to pitch into new fermentations? And with the, the, the aid of a, of, a, of a guy called Janssen, who was a coppersmith, they devised the pure, the first pure yeast culture plant. Which on the, in, 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 the, in the technical quarterly paper, there's a picture of it, it's figure three. And um, it was very really successful indeed. And the Carlsberg family, being the philanthropic body that they were then, and they still try to be today, uh, um, advertised this uh, new pure yeast culture plant and offered a design of it to anybody who was interested. And the first people ever to take up this offer were Heineken in 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 in, in, uh, in, in, in the Netherlands, and then a number of um, American brewing companies also picked up on this uh, possibility. And Schlitz no longer existed, I'm afraid, uh, with the first uh, North American brewing company to use this uh, PYC contraption to brew their own, to, to produce their own yeast. This was followed very shortly by Coors and a number of other uh, brewing companies, including my old company, Labatt. And, um, and, and that's where it went from there. And that's where pure yeast culture became uh, the, the, the thing to use. And it was primarily used by lager strains. The 
The ale brewers, which of course in those days were mainly still were in the UK, and um, they decided that really wasn't for them. There was a guy who was there uh, of, of, of Bass Brewers called um, Horace Brown, who was a very famous brewing scientist, advocated that it wasn't really the thing for them. And it, was, and, and it took a long, long time for aid yeast to go through the same study as lag yeast had gone through. And in fact, when I joined the Bats in 1969, uh, the first job I was asked to do was to look at the eighties, the bats use, and don't forget in those days, particularly in in Canada, particularly in Ontario and Quebec and the East Coast as well. There was a lot of ale produced in that part of the world. It was a pale ale, but it was and really the yeast, which the the eighties, was then used empirically, very much empirically. And the first job, as I say, I was asked to do in 1969, 1970, was to look at the the Bath Ailes, which people had no idea where it came from. I could, I, when I started talking to brewers and whoever else, nobody knew, and, and we found it consisted of two separate Ailey strains. That's how we were able to sort out the Bath Ailes. And, and my, my major competitors, Molson's, had been known to us at the time, were pretty well doing the same thing at the same time. And so that's how really uh, the whole propagation thing began. At the same time, the Japanese, of course they were lager brewers, were doing more of the same thing as well. It's amazing how different brewing companies from different parts of the world were, were pretty well doing the same thing. And so pure yeast culture became an, an, an important area for them to, for them to, to work on. And, and, and pure yeast culture systems to get enough yeast to work became important. And then the, the whole question of how often can we use a particular culture before we go back to the pure yeast culture plant. And this caused a lot of controversy. And it was soon found that, well, using it forever and ever, amen, was not really the thing to do. And the number of cycles or generations, many brewers still call it generations, it's not generations, it's cycles. Um, found that a limited number of, of, of cycles was the way to go. And uh, 20 cycles in those days, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm now in the late 60s, early 70s, was appropriate way to go. But as companies, again, I have to use the the experience of my old company uh, in Canada we went to higher and higher gravity and the Bats was certainly one of the first uh, brewing companies to go into high gravity brewing in a big way we found that we had to reduce the number of cycles as the gravity was increased so with the 14, 16 eventually 18 Plato the number of cycles had to be reduced and that, was, and that is still the case to, to, to this day Aside from the, the obvious necessity to keep brewer yeast cultures free of bacteria and wild yeast, let's talk about what happens in regards to fermenta- fermentation performance, beer flavor, quality, and stability over time when yeast is repitched for many, many cycles. Well, what are the problems with old cultures? Well, uh, that's a good question, John. Um, the, a lot of people have said, I had a boss once in the past who thought that going back to the pure yeast culture plant after, say, uh, 10, maybe 15 cycles or whatever, was a waste of time and why why, why, why would the yeast become weaker and weaker? But it did. And one of the, the fermentations became sluggish, particularly the, the, the rate of uptake of the two important fermentable sugars in words, that's maltose and maltotriose, that became uh, slower and slower. And also, yeast didn't grow so well, and the yeast would settle out earlier. Therefore, you get premature flocculation. And again, that was another factor which uh, had an effect upon wood fermentation rate because the yeast was no longer there in suspension to, 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 do, to, to, to ferment wood. And, then, and, 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 and the other two factors that are related to that very much so are the levels of the two intercellular storage uh, uh, compos, uh, carbohydrates, uh, trihalose and glycogen. And it, we've certainly found that uh, 
uh, when you recycle yeast, the level of trehalose goes up, which is an indication of the stress the yeast is on, because trehalose is a factor the yeast responds to under stress. And the level of glycogen, which is in the intercellular storage compound, which the yeast needs during the very, very early stages of fermentation, goes down. So the yeast doesn't have a storage glycogen for which to rely upon to, to synthesize important uh, cellular constituents, mainly, mainly uh, sterols and unsaturated fatty acids, which are very important in the structure of the of yeast cell membranes, particularly the plasma membrane. And all those factors, have been, have, 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 I don't think we still uh, completely understand all the factors. All we can do is to add a number of parameters, like, for example, the level of trihalose and glycogen, into the mix and say this is what probably happens. But I, I, I'm fairly convinced that after a number of cycles, most brewers need to go back to their yeast, uh, their culture, and grow through a pure yeast culture plant. Graham, if a if a brewer is doing everything right to minimize yeast stress factors, they might get let's say five or ten cycles out of a culture before some of the performance problems you talked about earlier are realized. But stress factors are abundant in today's craft beer landscape. Tell us about some of those stress factors and their impact. Well, certainly, uh, more and more we understand the stress factors. The number one stress factor, which doesn't so apply to the craft industry because they're not so much into it, is the whole question of high gravity brewing, of course. Uh, I mean, one of the things that, that, that drove us, when I say yes, I mean the bad, uh, drove us to give less and less cycles was as the gravity of the wood went up and the gravity of the wood was, was, was increased originally of course as a means of saving capital expenditure to give us more capacity uh, but um, the, 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 the other factors that affect uh, the yeast is, is of course pH, lower pHs and of course at the end of fermentation the pH is usually you know 4, 4, 2 or something some, some, perhaps a bit lower that's the stress factor Certainly, uh, uh, any form of contamination can be a stress factor. Certainly, the the, the, the number of uh, the whole question of of yeast flocculation and how why yeast sediments out of suspension at the end of fermentation, uh, our, our, um, osmotic pressure, as I say, which of course is mainly high gravity induced, and of course at the end of the fermentation, the whole question of alcohol. Alcohol is is this toxic to a yeast cell? as it is to you and me if we drink too much. Well, that's a major factor as well. The other stress factor, which we were, I've been very much involved in all the years, is the whole question of centrifugation. As you centrifuge yeast, if you don't do it properly, uh, you, make sure that the, you make sure that the temperature is properly controlled and, there's, and, 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 there's, and the yeast is, yeast is, is properly um, centrifuged through, through, through a centrifuge. You can, that's another stress factor which affects the uh, the cell surface. Now, you can you can knock the cell surface of the yeast cell around. Uh, the yeast cell surface consists of mannan and glucan, uh, which is what makes up a yeast cell wall. Those though, those materials can get knocked off the surface of the yeast, and they and that, that can cause. Uh, um, mannan proteins which won't sediment out and you can get haze problems. And there are a number of major, major brewing companies that I've been involved with that I won't, I can't, I won't say with the year. I've had effects on, on mannan protein hazes which give you this, this sort of haze, it's a sort of, it's an unfiltrable haze. Uh, and this, this can cause problems as well. I'd say that probably the two biggest stress factors I see in the craft beer industry are not getting wort oxy oxygen concentration right, um, yeah. and then also um, maybe even more so is is the way that yeast is stored in between cycles. Uh, you know, both the time and, and and conditions. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? The okay, importance yeah, well, of that. The most important thing is there's a storage. One, make sure the temperature is, is, is kept right, two, four degrees centigrade. 
Um, and also, if you're going to keep yeast stored, slowly stir it, but don't stir it, stir, stir it in such a way that you'll get a vortex. Again, if you stir it too fast, again, the yeast will, will have an effect upon the outside of the cell surface, and you'll get uh, manan protein hazes as well. So that's another way. Uh, the other thing is don't, you can store yeast for a long period of time as long as you make sure these conditions are, uh, are looked after. And I can cite you an example of a brewery, uh, in, in, again, in a bad system, that had a strike that went on for about five months. And uh, that, the yeast they had was, uh, was stored perfectly. And I remember saying to the, um, the uh, chief microbiologist in that particular brewery, when the, the strike was over, and he said, I think the yeast is fine. And he was right, it was fine. But it was stored properly. It was kept at the right temperature. The, 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 the concentration of alcohol in the medium in which it was stored was about uh, 3 or 4%. Uh, anything higher than that would have caused problems. And then, then it was fine. Now, it, there are strain variations between different, di different yeast strains. And, and, and you have, it, it's a case of knowing thy strain. I mean, knowing what, 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 what different strain will can and cannot stand. And don't try to extrapolate somebody else's experience directly to your own strength. Use anything that, that they, 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 they can advise you on, of course, and be aware of it, but don't expect that strain to, to react to the same as your strain. It's a, again, it's a case of no thy yeast. Okay, let's get into some of the basics of yeast propagation. Why don't you tell us about the difference between anaerobic and aerobic yeast metabolism? Okay. Uh, you, don't forget that if you're going to grow yeast, you're not going to use yeast. F fermentation and yeast growth are two different systems. When you are growing yeast, you want to take the 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 sugars from wood. Assume you're going to grow it in wood. You're not going to grow it in some peculiar medium like the distillers do and grow it in molasses, which always struck me as a bit odd, but they do. Let's stay away from that for the time being. If you're going to grow yeast on wood, and therefore you've got all the, the major sugars, the major sugars, of course, being glucose, maltose, and maltose, those sugars will be used by the yeast as a form of carbon to give you new biomass, new cells. And therefore you don't want to produce alcohol, because that's a waste. You don't want alcohol produced in this in, 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 in this process. You want cell, cells with biomass. And you can use that, as I say, then to produce new cells. And the important thing when you're growing yeast for biomass production, for use in a brewery, is to scale up the process gradually. Don't you start off with two or three or four litres and go all the way up to... Um, 50 hectoliters, but do it in, 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 in gradual stages. And, and that's the way to do it. If you go too fast up through the, uh, the size of the, uh, the, the uh, I'm going to say fermentations, they're not fermentations, they're growth phases, because you want oxygen present as well. The, 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 there's a big difference between the, pro the, the, the process. You, when you ferment, you produce alcohol. When you produce biomass, you produce cells. And oxygen is needed to produce cells. Only a small amount of oxygen is required to be in your fermentation. And they are different processes. Coming up. The last thing you want during the propagation phase is yeast producing alcohol, because alcohol will retard yeast growth. I'm John Bryce, and you're listening to the Master Brewers Podcast from the Master Brewers Association of the Americas. The, the, the front doorbell might go in a minute because there's a, a, a delivery in progress. I even know what it is. It's our new book, actually. The size. Is... Oh, man. Give me a minute. Oh, man. You never know what's going to happen during an interview with Graham Stewart. Last time a fire alarm went off, and this time he got a special delivery hot off the press. Well, it should be packed up, I'll tell you. There we go. See it? Very nice. So there it is. That's 
third edition of the Handbook of Brewing. Pick up your copy of the Handbook of Brewing third edition right now or pre-order Graham's newest book, Brewing and Distilling Yeast, a personal account of his 50 years of yeast research. Both books are available by clicking store from mbaa.com. Here's what's coming up on the Master Brewers calendar. The 2018 District Ontario Technical Conference is January 24th through the 26th in Niagara Falls. The District St. Paul Minneapolis Scholarship Fundraiser is January 24th at Indeed Brewing. District Milwaukee meets at Good City Brewing January 25th. District Northern California holds its technical conference February 2nd at Sierra Nevada and Chico. The District St. Paul Minneapolis February meeting and scholarship drive is February 8th at Surly Brewing. District St. Louis meets at O'Fallon Brewery on February 15th. The Fundamentals of Cut and Stack Labeling webinar is February 19th. District Rocky Mountain meets at AB in Fort Collins, February 22nd. District Philly will be at Trogues, February 23rd. District Milwaukee and the Wisconsin Brewers Guild hold a joint technical conference March 1st and 2nd at Badger State Brewing. District Mid-South meets at Mill Creek in Nashville, March 2nd and 3rd. District Northern Rockies meets in Bozeman, March 2nd. The District Midwest Spring Meeting is at Mad Tree Brewing, March 10th. Districts Michigan and St. Louis both meet March 15th. And check out the speaker lineup for the 2018 Eastern Technical Conference March 23rd and 24th in Atlantic City. View the full count of events at mbaa.com for more details or to find a district meeting near you. Now back to the show. In the presence of oxygen, normally yeast will grow. In the absence of oxygen, yeast will ferment because it, it, it doesn't have enough material to go any further. And therefore, the process depends on the two. So that in a larger, when, when you've got a lot of sugar and as far as the yeast cells are concerned, a typical word is a lot of sugar. If you go look at how other, other people who, who conduct fermentations with, 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 for example, baker's yeast production, for example, they keep the, the, uh, the, the level of sugars to an absolute minimum and the level of oxygen to an absolute maximum. And as, as fast as the yeast metabolizes the oxygen, it takes up the sugars. And don't forget, it's probably not using words, it's probably using molasses. Therefore, the sugars are sucrose and glucose and fructose. Those sugars are taken up immediately, and then they are metabolized to, uh, to, 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 to give you, give you uh, uh, biomass. That's how, that's typical production of baker yeast and the and the, the distillers, certainly in Scotland and other parts, and certainly would be also the case for bourbon production in, 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 in the United States or so rye production in Canada. Uh, as fast as that's happening, the yeast, the yeast takes up the sugars. And there's no uh, sugars left. It's as fast as it's there, it's taken. That, 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 that's the Pasteur effect. The Crabtree effect, which is an odd thing, because Crabtree never worked on yeast, he worked on tumor cells. But it was applied to the work he did. He found that large amounts of the sugars can affect fermentation. And therefore, again, you've got to make sure that the large amount of sugars are not present, again, because you can get the same effect. It's a, it's a contradictory process which took people a long time to understand. And in fact, uh, most of that work putting the two processes together and the standing were done by um, uh, a, a baker's yeast producer called Distillers Company, because it was a subsidiary of, the, of DCL, it's now Diageo, uh, to, to, to understand how to produce yeast. And they, they really uh, pioneered yeast growth. And those two were uh, very much important in the way you produce yeast for subsequent fermentation like, for example, in, 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 in fermentation. Like, for example, in brewing fermentations. Does that make any sense? It does. Um, how about how about getting? Uh, in- it, John, it is, it, it, it is a bit of a conflict. You know, you know, it's difficult to understand. I appreciate that. And most took brewers a long time to recognize 
Why the hell can't we produce yeast in exactly the same way as distillers produce yeast? Particularly, as they say, in this country, where yeast... And, and, and to be fair, in, in, in the United States, because you've got the Red Star uh, uh, yeast production system, whose major factory uh, was in Milwaukee, I think it still is, and in, 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 there was a time when there were three major breweries in Milwaukee, Schletz, Paps, and, um, and Miller. And uh, people couldn't understand why we can't use their system to produce the yeast that we're going to use to produce, to produce the yeast which goes into our word fermentation. But the two don't apply. Uh, the other important thing to make sure during yeast growth for brewing, let's the baker's yeast out of it, is, is, is this whole question of glycogen. You must make sure that the yeast has a substantial amount of stored glycogen so that when the yeast is pitched into wort with some oxygen after a short lag, and I mean less than six hours, the yeast will start producing uh, uh, sterols and fatty acids which go into the, the structure of the, the structure of the uh, of, this, of cell membranes. How about the basic, the two basic approaches to yeast propagation in the brewery? What are those, and which is uh, which do you think is the most practical for the average craft brewer, if there is such the a thing? Pro- average craft brewer is to slowly and surely scale up his yeast. Do it. I mean, you can do it by uh, by manipulating the oxygen. But all that, now that's been very fancy. I mean, if you look at the, the methods that, um, that we used to use in the bats and the methods that um, Anna Bush used in that gigantic yeast propagation plant they've got in, uh, in, in St. Louis, it's very, it, 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 to some extent, it's too fancy, quite frankly. The way to do it is to slowly but surely have some oxygen present. Of course, you need oxygen present during growth because yeast won't grow properly otherwise. It, it'll, it'll produce alcohol. The last thing you want during the propagation phase is yeast producing alcohol because alcohol will retard yeast growth. But So therefore, slowly but surely, scale up the process. And I think, well, I'm trying to think, one of, one of the... One of the figures in this, well, it, yeah, it, it talks about this. It's a scale up process in many ways that that um, that Hansen devised all those many years ago in Copenhagen. He slowly but surely scaled up. But if you look at figure three, it shows you a rather old, old fashioned pure yeast culture plant, but it's still the basics are still correct. But of course, in this day and age, you can pro- you can actually you can get better controls, you can buy these propagation plants off the shelf. <clears throat> Whether you want to go to that expense, I don't know. Uh, if I, it depends on the size of, a, of, of, of your craft brewery. If it's only, uh, say, I don't know, but, most, but many craft breweries, you know better than I do, uh, uh, aren't microbreweries anymore. Some of them are pretty big. And you slowly but surely you scale up. And the important thing during that that process, for God's sake, though, make sure the process uh, is, is still sterile. You don't get any contamination. The last thing you want is at the end of your propagation phase a contaminated uh, 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 yeast culture. You don't want that. Uh, you, no, some breweries. Uh, and I can't give you an example of what it does. It I'm going to always acid wash the yeast after every seed to make absolutely sure that you don't get contamination. But the other, f- that's only to alleviate contamination with bacteria. But don't forget, also you can get wild yeast, and that was one of the, one, one of the problems that, that Hansen had to get around because two of those four cultures that he worked with were in fact uh, wild yeast. They weren't Saccharomyces at all. Acid washing does nothing for alleviating yeast contamination, even about culture contamination by wild yeast. Yeah, I think that's an important point. And um, as you've probably heard, there's a lot of to do in the U.S. about you know diastaticus contamination and you know whether or not it's coming from yeast suppliers and that sort of thing. So, I'm talking to one of the suppliers about it. Um, uh, 
I don't know, because we, we, we did a lot of work on those, I guess, many years ago. Not as a contaminant. We were interested in the, uh, uh, it goes back to, again, to my Labatt days. Uh, it goes back to the interest that we had in whether the, the, glucu- the, um, the glucoamylase produced by Saccharomyces diastatagus was of any use to, to, to a brewer to, when, when light beers became very popular. Um, the answer was the answer is it's, 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 it's not a very good glucoamylase. It doesn't do the right things. It's it doesn't it doesn't uh, ferment. Uh, it doesn't really ferment branch points. I'm sorry, we're digressing a bit now. Uh, it doesn't ferment uh, uh, branch points in starch, and it is very thermostable enzyme. That enzyme is not knocked out, not inac- inactivated by uh, pasteurization. Yeah, I, I, I saw that in the paper you shared on the Ask the Brewmasters uh, a few weeks ago. That was that was new yeah. new information to me. I thought that was very interesting. Well, we, we thought we thought we might be able to use it for uh, for light beer. It, we, uh, in the end, after a it was a PhD project because we had a close relationship with the University of Western Ontario, and I was a visiting professor there. And uh, uh, so I used to supervise PhD students in the, the laboratory. But actually, they were doing PhDs up the road, as we used to say, at the University of Western Ontario, which was only three miles away. Anyway. And uh, she, uh, Judy Gallows, who did all this work, and it was a nice thesis, had to come to a conclusion in the end that the enzyme is no damn good. <laughs> it's, it really it's, it's heavily glycosylated, and it's, it's, it's got amazing temperature stability. And we did some genetic work on it, and we produced some very interesting strains. Uh, also, the problem with Saccharomyces diastaticus, of course, is that as well as producing this enzyme, which is temperature stable, it produces the phenolic off flavor for vinyl glycol. And so you've got a clove like flavor in your beer as well, which can also cause a bit of a problem if, that, if, you, if you don't want it. There we are. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's go back to oxygen and propagation. Uh, the the oxygen requirement is different for fed batch propagations versus incremental propagations, which we haven't really talked a lot about fed batch yet. But why don't you comment on why that oxygen requirement is different between the two yeah, systems? Test it, test it different. You've got to be careful. Oxygen is required by yeast during growth, of course, because it, 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 it wants to have an operational uh, tricarboxylic acid cycle. So that so it produces more energy. During a normal fermentation, the amount of energy produced for the yeast cell is, is relatively low. The major product of, of, uh, during a fermentation, of course, is, 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 is ethanol, carbon dioxide, and to a less extent, glycerol. Now, uh, during the, the, what's known as the glycolytic pathway, the yeast produces a small amount of energy in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. If you have an aerobic system, you get a hell of a lot more ATP and no ethanol and very little carbon dioxide and no glycerol. And therefore, that energy is needed so the yeast can grow, produce biomass, it can produce proteins, enzymes, lipids and all the bits and bobs it needs to produce a cell. Not just one cell, a lot of cells. That's your biomass. And therefore, that's why you need it. But the, the, the fed bat system, as, as you feed into the system, as fast as the, the word goes into the system, through a fed batch, the Sugars, and I say mainly glucose, maltose, maltodiose, are utilized by the yeast. And there's no accumulation of sugars. There's no accumulation of sugars which will affect the osmotic pressure. And therefore, the, the, the system operates to where all the sugars go to produce biomass, and say mainly proteins and carb, large carbohydrates for cell walls and all the rest of it. That's the fed bad system. That's the, uh, a much more efficient way of producing biomass. But if you're a small craft brewer and you do want something quite so fancy, to me the way to do it is to slowly but surely increase the, 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 the size of the fermentation. You start off with, well, I don't know, 
uh, two, three uh, litres and go up to maybe 20, 30, 40 uh, uh, hectares. But you slowly increase the size. The trouble with that system, particularly if you've got a, 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 a process where perhaps people don't understand the microbiology that well, you can get a contaminated process. And the last thing he was, as I say, I'm repeating myself, is is is, is, is um it's a contaminated um a culture at the end of it all or that lot because you just probably wasted your time. It's one of the reasons. One of the reasons why you decide you want a new culture is to eliminate any form of contamination. <laughs> That was one of my favorite guests, Graham Stewart, here on the Master Brewers podcast. If you like what you heard today, check out Graham's article in the Master Brewers Technical Quarterly, Volume 54, Number 3. You can get there from the publications menu or by typing propagation into the industry's best search bar at mbaa.com. One hundred and thirty years ago, Master Brewers was built on the concept of brewers helping each other out so we could all make the best possible beer. That's still true to this day, and it's where a lot of the camaraderie in this industry originated. Master Brewers' award-winning Ask the Brewmasters is the best place to go for troubleshooting, where you'll find the industry's only discussion forum that's moderated for technical accuracy by a team of experts. See what everyone else is talking about at community.mbaa.com. United, we brew. Do you enjoy today's episode? Would you like us to keep making more? If so, there's a really simple way you can let us know. Subscribe, rate, and review the Master Brewers podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, I can't get stuck, I can't be losing too much And then I'm heading out to any other place